So as people enter the room, um, I'll just speak sort of slowly as I welcome everyone. My name is Claire. I'm the event coordinator for Village Books in Bellingham and Linden, Washington, and I want to welcome you to this very special event this evening um, that we have that we are very excited for. Um, I'm going to recommend tonight that you keep your view on your screen in gallery view. If you look in the upper right hand corner of your screen, you'll see a little it says view. And if you click on that, if you select a gallery view, I think you'll have a better sort of visual experience because um, this is a celebration tonight. There's going to be a number of people on the screen and um, it's going to, I think, feel much more intimate if you can have everybody all together. So again, that would be gallery view um, in the upper right hand corner. We are going to keep the chat open tonight too. So if you want to engage back and forth with each other in the chat, please feel free to do that. Um, and then if you have questions throughout the evening, we encourage you to please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of the screen. Um, since we are keeping the chat open, questions that are put in the chat have a tendency to sort of cycle up and disappear. So if a question occurs to you sometime during the, uh, the event this evening, please just pop it into the Q&A feature so we can gather all the questions there. We will have a Q&A uh, period at the end of the presentation, so we're not going to answer your questions as they come in. We'll do that at the end. So in other words, stick around because it's going to be great all the way till the end. I do want to state that the virtual readings gallery at Village Books is a safe space. Any user exhibiting offensive or inappropriate behavior will be dismissed from the event immediately. So I'm so excited because this is um, one of the events that's part of our Nature of Writing series in partnership with the North Cascades Institute. And we have one of the best lineups um, in spring than, that we've had in recent memory. Um, we're very proud of, of being able to maintain this programming throughout the um, throughout the pandemic. So uh, I want to let you know about the next event that's coming up. And that is, that was Christian. He's going to come back in just a second. So on April 3rd at 7 p.m., we'll be welcoming Bjorn Deal and Joe Scott. So before he gets started, I want to introduce him. So first, I'd like to welcome Christian Martin to the stage. So for the past 15 years, Christian has served as the Marketing and Communications Manager for North Cascades Institute. He has coordinated Institute events with some of the very best writers on the natural world, including Gary Snyder, Terry Tempest Williams, Rick Bass, Robert Michael Pyle, Mary Oliver, Wendell Berry, and tonight's featured presenter, Kathleen Dean Moore. His own nature and travel writing appears in several regional publications and with the Mountaineers books. So please join me in welcoming Christian Martin. Welcome, Christian. Hi, thank you, Claire. Appreciate that introduction. Um, first of all, I want to respectfully acknowledge the Coast Salish people who have stewarded the land where I am standing throughout the generations. I offer this acknowledgement as a first step in honoring the relationship with the land that we share, as a call towards further learning and action, and to assist in giving them voice. The North Cascades Institute, where I work, is a conservation nonprofit founded in 1986 that uses education as the tool to conserve and restore the natural world. Our mission is to inspire environmental stewardship through transformative learning experiences in nature. And we offer programs for people of all ages to explore, enjoy, and engage with the mountains, rivers, forests, people, and wildlife of the Pacific Northwest so that all will care for and protect this special place. Our programs include Mountain School, a three-day environmental education experience for fifth graders from Skagit and Whatcom counties, youth leadership adventures, which are eight and 12-day backpacking and canoe camping field courses that connect ninth through 12th grade students to the natural world while engaging them in conversations about climate change and climate solutions, as well as a diverse suite of programs for adults and families which include field classes, family camps, art and writing retreats, and boat tours on Diablo Lake. Most of our programs take place at the North Cascades Environmental Learning Center, which opened in 2005 on Diablo Lake, in the heart of the National Park, which is three hours from Seattle, two from Bellingham. 
Now, like most everybody else on, on this uh, chat, on this Zoom, the Institute had a really challenging year in 2020. Most of our programs were canceled and the Learning Center was temporarily closed. But this forced downtime gave us the opportunity to develop educational programs online. And we discovered that we could reach a broader and more diverse audience this way. So in 2021, we're so excited to be slowly ramping our programs back up this spring and to be reopening the Environmental Learning Center next month. And we're also gonna to continue to offer a great slate of online classes too. We have more than 40 classes open on our website right now, which cover everything from digital photography to wolves in Washington, geology to Corvid mythology, as well as several in-person field courses in the family camps at the Learning Center. So you can learn about all these different programs on our website at ncascades.org. That's the letter N, cascades.org. Thank you for hearing my spiel on um, the North Cascades Institute, where I'm really proud to work, and on to our presenters. Uh, we have a, a pretty exciting slate of people that will be popping in, but we're going to get started with two people, Saul Weisberg, my boss, and Kathleen D. Moore. Saul Weisberg is the executive director and the co-founder of North Cascades Institute. He's an ecologist, a naturalist, and a writer who's explored the mountains and rivers of the Pacific Northwest for more than 35 years. He's authored several books, including North Cascades, The Story Behind the Scenery, Teaching for Wilderness, and my favorite one, Headwaters, Poems and Field Notes. Saul and his family live in Bellingham, and this is really big news. Saul is actually retiring at the end of June after 35 years at the helm of the Institute. So we're excited for him and we're going to host a series of online events, uh, one every month between now and June, that celebrates Saul's leadership and his accomplishments, including a really exciting event uh, with Village Books as part of the speaker series here that will take place on May 13th on Zoom. And that's going to be Saul in conversation with the journalist William Dietrich and the author and former Dean of Huxley College, John Miles. So the three of them are gonna have a great conversation about um, environmental education and the stories around the Institute and uh, their favorite nature books and all that kind of stuff. So the details for that event are on uh, the Institute's website as well as Village Books website. When I asked Saul, uh, what is he looking forward to the most in his much deserved retirement? He replied simply, more poetry, less administration. And last but definitely not least, Kathleen Dean Moore. She's the author or co-editor of many books about our moral and emotional bonds to the wild and reeling world, including Wild Comfort, Moral Ground, Pine Island Paradox, and the now classics River Walking and Hold Fast, which have a treasured spot on my bookshelf here. Kathleen is the recipient of the Pacific Northwest Booksellers Association Book Award, the Oregon Book Award, and for her novel, Piano Tide, she won the Willa Literary Award. A philosopher and an activist, Kathleen writes from Corvallis, Oregon, and Chichigoff Island in Alaska. So that's all from me, and let's welcome Saul and Kathleen to our presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Christian. And thank you, Claire. And hey, Saul. Thanks for coming out to the party. Last time uh, we talked, you and I were listening to cactus wrens. <laughs> quack, 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 quack. <laughs> what are you? What are you hearing outside there now? Oh, I'm not hearing cactus wrens, but uh, yeah. it's a uh, it's pretty good right now. Things are really starting to happen. Uh, let's see. This evening, I've been hearing robins, chickadees, juncos, towhees. A uh, couple of white crowned sparrows, so it's definitely it's definitely starting up, and it just it feels really good. That's wonderful. Well, I'm glad that you're here with us, and I also want to say how happy I am that the readers are with us. Readers are everything, and so I, I think about readers all the time. I think about what a gift a reader is, and I've been thinking about what kind of a metaphor could I come up with that would explain how absolutely essential a reader is to a writer. So let me try these a couple of these out on you, okay? How about a writer without readers is like a wind 
without aspen leaves? Or how about a writer without readers is like an exhalation without a flute? Or a hickory nut without soil? Just, just a nut. At any rate, all, all my love goes out to you. Well, Kathy, it's so good to see you on this beautiful evening. Um, I was really delighted to begin re reading your new book, Earth Wild, Earth's Wild Music, a few nights ago. So uh, let's open the virtual wine and talk a while uh, <laughs> before um, the other guests you've invited start to arrive. So um, you've written a lot, and I was really curious about how come this particular book at this particular point in your life? Yeah, you know, um... From the time I started writing essays, I've called myself a nature writer, even though I've never been quite sure what that work entails. You know, the poet Mary Oliver wrote, my work is loving the world, which is mostly standing still and learning to be astonished, which is mostly rejoicing, which is gratitude. And I thought, you know, that sounds like something I could actually do. You just go to say someplace wonderful and you open your heart, you open your journal and you tell the truth. But then as time went on, loving the world got uh, more complicated because while I was celebrating this world, it was slipping away. No, no, that's not true. It was not slipping away. It was being destroyed. And you and I were born into this world that was packed with life and beauty. And in the 50 years, it has been 50 years, it's in the 50 years that I've been writing about nature. The number of individual plants and animals has been reduced by 40% or zero. The population of American birds, the ones you were mentioning, Saul, the red-winged blackbirds and the robins has been caught by a third. And the prairie birds have been cut in half Unless the world stops the extinctions, I'm gonna write my last nature essay on a planet that is half as song graced and life drenched as the one where I began to write. You know, can you even imagine? And we've hardly noticed my neighbor across the street says, the extinction of the earth's music. She says, is that a thing? <laughs> wow, it is a thing. And that puts, I would assume that puts you and all nature writers in a really tough spot. Yeah, yeah. So here's the dilemma. I mean, how do you, how do you open people's hearts without breaking them? How do you write about this beautiful singing world without lying by omitting the facts about its destiny? I knew what I wanted to do. You know, here's what I want to do. I told myself, I want to write about Earth's wild music. Claire, maybe you could pop up some of these pictures. I want to write a love song to a vanishing world. I want to tell, you want to keep flipping them for me, Claire? I want to tell how beautiful it is when the sun reaches the rim and the song of the canyon wren pours over the rim rock like this little waterfall. I wanna write about how totally cool it is to sit in a lawn chair that is half submerged in a pond after dark and listen to the red-legged frogs singing underwater. I wanna tell people about Tyrannosaurus Rex, males who, who, who danced like sage grouse. I wanna learn why music and dancing evolved on this planet again and again. You know, I already know that it took 68 million years for birdsong to evolve and that it will take five to seven million years for earth to recover the diversity it lost in our lifetimes. And yeah, I wanna, I wanna write about what it's like to wander over a sand dune under a full moon, listening for sidewinder rattlesnakes. And I wanna talk about why, why sap suckers rap in that rhythm, that drum dee 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 dee. <laughs> wow, those are great images. Well, 
why do sap suckers rap in that drum diddy dee dee uh, rhythm? <laughs> I'm sure there's a story there. There's a story there. Thank you, Saul. Thank you for asking because what I'd like to do is read a very short excerpt from the essay that's called The Love Child of Father Time and Mother Earth from Earth's Wild Music. Yesterday was the longest day of the year. At our Alaska cabin, the sun shone for 18 hours and 16 minutes. The steady increase in light building up to that splendid achievement made me just plain happy. I was even happy when a sap sucker pounded on our metal roof at 3.51 a.m., one minute after sunrise. The drumbeat was sharp and insistent. What good luck it was for him to find the drumhead of our metal roof to amplify sound far out of proportion to the scrawny little bird. It must be powerfully rewarding for something so small to make a sound so large. It hadn't occurred to me that our cabin was designed in the long tradition of drums, but of course it is. From now on, I will call our cabin the drum. Beside me in bed, listening to the sap sucker, my husband said, it is amazing that little guy doesn't give himself a concussion. And it's true that when I've watched him, gripping the sill with gangly claws, propping himself on his tail, hunching over the roof, banging away with his beak, as if it's as if he were typing some manifesto of birdness that is important enough to save the world. I have wondered. The beak is uneven, Frank said. Understand that Frank sleeps with the sleeve of a black sweatshirt across his eyes to keep out the light. So the voice discoursing on sap suckers came from a big biologist lying on his back, looking like the Lone Ranger. The top bill is longer and not so strongly connected to the skull, he said. The lower one is heavier. It sends the vibrations down away from his brain. And then there's the thick spongy skull and the brain tightly packed into it. So it doesn't slosh around in a sea of cerebrospinal fluid and smack on the skull back and forth like a loose skiff between the dock and the break wall in a gale. Also, Frank said. I rolled over to face him. Why do you think the sap sucker taps that rhythm? He pulled the sleeve off his face. Brum dee 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 dee. He paused for a long time and then he did it again. Brum dee 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 dee. Four o'clock in the morning, and this man was lying with his eyes closed, doing an adequate imitation of a woodpecker. I don't know. I give up. So the pounding creates heat energy, he said, right? Like nails get hot when they're pounded. It's a bad fever when your brain heats up. So the sap sucker has to count time between riffs to let his brain cool down. Frank plummeted back to sleep, but I lay sort of dazed and dozing, dreaming of father time and mother nature biting and kissing as they rolled down the beach the fierce battle between the forces of destruction and the forces of creation. Father Time in my dream had a tangled beard and a dirty white robe, but somehow he'd lost his shepherd's crook. And she wore nothing at all, a hefty, ripe old woman. Oh, they love each other and they hate each other and they need each other. Father Time, the agent of crumble and disruption, endless depletion, Mass dying, selective dying, a force hungry enough to eat mountains. Mother nature, inevitable creation and imaginative flowering, endless giving. She tries that, or better this, maybe a twist in the tune or another color in the mustache, maybe red this time. Through millions of years of no holds barred evolution, they wrestle and scold and make wild love. Together, they create new life forms ongoing, and somehow they figured out the sap sucker. So the essay goes on, and as every essay, um, it celebrates this beautiful song, but then at the end of the essay, there is always a box. And here's what that box says. Numbers of red-breasted sap suckers are declining slowly, 
as Northwest forests are repeatedly cut. If average global temperature rises by 1.5 degrees centigrade, the sapsuckers will gain 18% of their range as the birds move north and maintain 40, uh, 34%, but lose 66% as spring nesting seasons become too hot for the chicks. I need to hear you, Saul. I think you're. Um, I was. Yeah. Um, I was saying I'm not really happy with that box um, at the end there. So what do you think now? What's the work of loving this, this weary, teary, increasingly silenced word? What would you say to Mary Oliver if you could meet her now? Is our work still loving the world? Yeah, I once talked to this convention of national park rangers. They are as weary and love-soaked a group as you will find. And afterward, one said, I like what you say, but I wish you would say it without using the L word. I go, L word? Yeah, he said, love. So I asked him, what word should we use instead of love? And he thought for a long time. And then he said, maybe instead we could say, listen to. To hear with thoughtful attention, to be silenced by the astonishment of its beauty, to attend to it, to be delighted by it, to wonder about its mysteries, to stay awake to it, to move close to it in the wild night, to let its sound cover you and keep you safe. To me, listening is starting to sound an awful lot like love. Yeah, I've, I've been reading the book and, and this is a book about listening. And in each essay, you take us off to hear this wonderful sound, uh, some sounds I, which I have never heard and didn't even know existed. And then at the end, you add this little shaded box that tells us, you know, um, what's going on, the conservation status of the animal, um, how long this species has to live, that really stopped me. You know, not just how long this creature has to live, but how long this species has to live. And you tell stories about the wild music, but of course what we're hearing at the same time or you're showing us at the same time is that we have to listen to the silences too. Yeah, so the, the subtitle of the book ends up being celebrating and defending the story, the songs of the natural world. We had a great debate in the publishing house about that subtitle. I wanted to call the book um, at first, Earth's Wild Music in Memoriam. But eulogizing isn't the work of loving the world. Not now, not, not yet. The work now I think is to celebrate and to defend. And that kind of joy, that kind of determination to protect it fiercely and faithfully, that's really what the book is about. Yeah, yeah, it's, uh, well, you know, at the end of a life, we celebrate, if we're, if we're lucky, and in many ways, that's what we're doing, we're celebrating. And yeah. um, it is. Well, I think it's time for our special guest to arrive. You've invited some, um, what did you call them, world-class listeners? They so, are, they are. Let's, uh, let's, let's begin to welcome them. Okay. Well, here is my dear friend, Hank Lenfer. Hi, Hank. Hello. From, from Gustavus, um, Alaska, or are you in Juneau? I'm in Juneau right now. Yep. You're in Juneau. Hank is the author of The Faith of Cranes. It's a wonderful book. And his new book, the biography of Richard Nelson called Raven's Witness. And he is the man who, along with Nels, has recorded a sound library for the Glacier Bay National Park, a, a body of work that they call The Joy Project. Hank and I have had so many conversations and each one I ask him, you know, how do you navigate the world so joyously, even though it is so wounded? And I'll ask you again, Hank. I'll probably ask you until we're both not writing anymore. And uh, tonight, Kathy, I'm gonna answer that question with another question of your own. And oh, yeah. it is, um, it, 
is the last sentence in the prologue of Earth Wild Music. And it reads, in a time of terrible silencing, what can we hear if we listen carefully? And what can Earth's wild music tell us about how we ought to live? And when I think back about our decades long conversation about these related questions, um, I see the tension in our conversation is me saying, Kathy, sit, listen, and you saying, Hank, get off your butt and do the work of defending. And you have struck a much better balance than I have on that. So I, uh, um, I admire your, your fierceness in the defense, um, but you're right, listening is love. And uh, I live in a wild place surrounded by wild voices. It's a um, lux luxurious place to go out and listen. And I am constantly steeped in the lovely voices, the non-human voices that remind me all the time how diverse and wide our community of living creatures is. Yeah, you know, um, your library is just an amazing thing, your library of sounds. And I, I love thinking about you with your parabola. You know, it's, you know your parabola is big and you mm -hmm. paddled around Glacier Bay with this parabola and with your earphones and with that intense listening, you listen because why? Why, why do you listen? Uh, it is pure joy. It's the closest I'm ever going to come to meditation that when everything lines up and, and the birds right there, there's no background noises. Um, there's beautiful echo. The mic is rolling and I am nowhere else. There is no other thought in my mind except waiting for that next exquisite note to come pouring into my ears. And when the bird finally flies off, I am just left standing in astonishment and, and gratitude. And why would you not wake up at three in the morning and do that over and over and over, <laughs> given the opportunity? <laughs> so, set us up here. Tell us, will you just choose one sound that you love or one, one listening experience that you have that has moved you and, and, and tell us about it and then maybe you could even let us hear it? Yeah. Uh, um, this, this one recording was made all the more beautiful because I was with my daughter. She was 14 at the time. We'd been out camping for a week. We were boating back home. It was late August, late in the evening, uh, sun going down, Glacier Bay, just mirror calm. And we could see miles ahead, these um, uh, whale spouts um, coming up, back, backlit by the sun. We got near, um, I shut down the boat, Fortunate enough, no other boats around. And my daughter knew that she couldn't move once the mic's rolling, you couldn't make any noise. So we were just locked in this moment of listening. Um, and I'm gonna try and wade through the technology here. And, uh, and you can let me know if this is coming through. If not, I've got an alternative way to play it. Okay. You, you hear that? <laughs> Still hear that reverberating. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. That's extraordinary. You know, I, I, I want to welcome another guest here who also listens underwater. And uh, Mark, would you join us? Come on in. This is Mark Hickson, people. Mark is a is a marine ecologist and he dives underwater to study coral reefs all around the world, Australia, Bahamas, Hawaii. I know that's not a long enough list. A quick swim in the ocean and then down into the glitter fish and the slanting light. 
what a what a job you have, Mark. I've often thought that you had the best job of any professor in the whole world. <laughs> Aloha, Kathy. And thank you so much for, for inviting me to this. I'm delighted. Oh, absolutely. I'm so glad you're here because I have to check on this fact, Toyd. I've been told, I've been told that just as there's a dawn chorus of birds, that as the sun moves across the planet, the birds awaken and they sing in the morning. I've also heard that there's a dawn chorus in the coral reefs as the light slants in. Am I right? Partially. <laughs> <laughs> So actually what goes on in coral reefs is almost the opposite of what happens in a forest. Um, there's two groups of fish on reefs. There's the fish that are active during the day and the fish that are active during the night. And at dawn and dusk, there's actually what's called a quiet period. That's hmm. a period of time when all the fish are quiescent. And the reason they're quiescent then is that's when the predators are working, the sharks are out cruising around looking for prey. So everyone's hunkered down. And then when the night fish come out, they take their sounds. When the day fish come out, they make their sounds. And it's all day long and all night long, except for that dawn and dusk. What, what does it sound like? Oh gosh, it's much more a cacophony than it is a symphony. Um, it's, <laughs> um, it's a whole bunch of grunts and clicks and well, I can, let me start with the most prevalent sound on a coral reef. What, what creature do you, would you imagine makes the most prevalent sound on a healthy coral reef? Just throw out a name. Angelfish. No. <laughs> <laughs> so it's actually not even fish. The most prevalent sound on a healthy coral reef are things called snapping shrimp. And snapping shrimp are everywhere on the reef and you never see them but it's almost like crickets chirping at night, but during the day. So if I try, try to emulate that, if you're diving or snorkeling on a very healthy coral reef, it sounds like Rice Krispies. And for oh. those of you who are too young to know what Rice Krispies sound like, I'm gonna try to do it with a piece of cellophane in my fingers. I don't know if you can hear that or not. We, we totally it's, did. Yeah, it's, we did. It's snap, crackle, pop, really loud, just all over the reef, everywhere. That's the <laughs> most prevalent sound on the reef. And then the fish throw in their little things when they're chasing each other or courting each other or communicating with each other. It's amazing. It, 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 does it, um, is it overwhelming? Is it just a, a, a sound everywhere? It is sound everywhere, but it's at a fairly low level, so it's not distracting. It's not like being in a pot of whales underwater, which can be overwhelming. <laughs> That's for sure, like like Hank's one. Yes. Well, what, what, what happens when, this, when it's silent? What does silence mean on a reef then? Well, if it's during the day when the reef should be very noisy, it means that the reef has lost its animal life. And it's, it's, you know, you've heard of silent pond, of course. If you're on a silent reef during the day, that's a very, very bad sign. And, um, you know, that cacophony is what tells anyone on the reef that there's a lot of life there at that time, actively doing their thing. Have you heard silent reefs? I have, I have witnessed actually just about my favorite reef in the world died before my very eyes back in the glo first global bleaching and coral bleaching event back in 1997, 98. And it was, it was, it was one of the saddest things I've ever experienced and very strange to be flooding my face mask with tears. It was just literally overwhelming, but this reef went from, you know, all the beauty you've seen, on films of the colors and the variety of life to suddenly all the corals turning white as snow and then through time breaking down and degrading and the fish leaving and the shrimp going silent and um, then just a wasteland of, of brown colored algae and slime. It was absolutely heartbreaking. We can't stay there. 
very long without having our hearts broken. Can you can you show us? I think you have a clip where you can show us what some of these animals are. I do, so but, fish are but first I promise to make do my best fish imitations. Okay, good, good, good. I'm going to show you. This is pretty embarrassing, but fish just make weird sounds. So you have fish called grunts. First off, how do fish make sounds? They don't have lungs. They make sounds oh. two ways. They have teeth in their throat that grind together rhythmically. So if you, um, for example, get a grouper and you upset the grouper somehow, and I know that because I capture groupers underwater harmlessly to tag them, and they're very upset during that. And what a grouper sounds like when it's upset is, <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> That's an upset grouper. But then there's fish called grunts. There's fish called squirrel fish that makes sort of a little chirping sound. That's the other one I'm gonna to try to do, but it's very difficult. It's kind of a And that's just about my own vocabulary. So you have a whole, you have a whole variety of fish making a whole variety of sounds. Some of them are named after their sounds. Um, and I brought a 30 second video clip that gives a few more examples, but I ask everybody to turn up their volume. Thank you, Claire. When we're listening to a reef, we hear the, the snapping shrimp crackling away. And then as we add in chirping, perhaps, of some fish that are trying to impress a female on, on a nesting site. And then we've got the clownfish that are using sounds to communicate within a colony and particularly to warn each other of a predator. <laughs> That's great. Once I lifted a rock and I um, picked up a, a, a plane fin midshipman midshipman fish and I was holding it like this and it grunted right at me. Grunt, grunt. <laughs> <laughs> I think we have another guest coming. Rochelle, will you come on in? Hi. Yes. Hi, Rochelle. Welcome. Uh, uh, Rochelle is, is uh, a dear friend of mine from Corvallis. She's a concert pianist. And she's the artistic director of the Corvallis OSU Piano International. And Rochelle is actually the star of this new film, The Extinction Variations, <laughs> which I hope everyone will look up. You know, um, Rochelle, you have, you have something that might be a present for Mark. Um, do you have something you could play, Mark, that would be uh, a, an evocation of, of putting on your snorkel and going down? OK. so. Uh... You have to have that image in your mind. How's okay. That? Okay. You know, it's so important. I, I, I wanted to do Earth's Wild Music because it's music that goes straight into our hearts. Mm -hmm. you know, um, Rachel Carson didn't do, you know, a stinky spring or anything, or, or she did a silent spring because it's the silence that speaks so loudly. And, and music does you, how does it do it, Rochelle? How does the music That's a great open our question. hearts? I, it really does go straight to our hearts. I think it's because music uh, doesn't need any translation or pictures or words to be understood. It's just, uh, we can just feel music. We don't have to concentrate on what we're hearing and um, it's, it's, it's purely intuitive. Um, so yeah, it's kind of magical that way. Oh, can you show us? Well, sure. I, um, I think first, uh, let me let me think about this a bit. I think uh, in terms of nature and, and fish and <laughs> uh, the difference between listening to a grouper, which I, I got to practice the grouper fish call. That was amazing, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I think it's about being human. Uh, this this idea of um, how we listen to music 
um, it goes straight to our hearts, but um, we're listening with human ears. Uh, when we go out into nature and we listen to uh, animals and birds sending signals back and forth, we, and we, we listen to a bird and we, we love to call it a bird song, and it is a bird song, but it's also because we hear it that way. We hear it as music. We're hearing and we're moved emotionally by this, this sequence of notes that we hear in, in the bird song. And uh, it's very much the same way when we play the music that we create on the piano. Um, it's about the relationships and the harmonies. So if I just play a middle C, chances are that's not conjuring up much of a, an emotion in you. You're not engaging yet. But if I play two notes, I go up a minor seventh from that middle C, you start to feel something because there's a relationship there and uh, that's a very warm and inviting sound, at least I think so. Um, so we start to hear these harmonies and they move us. Um, Leonard Bernstein certainly knew about those two notes when he was writing uh, West Side Story, his beautiful song, Somewhere. This is a, a symbol of love and hope at that point. Um, yes. That the, yes. There are different kinds of relationships. And I know Kathy wants me to talk about the augmented fourth because <laughs> when she hears an augmented fourth, she thinks of the call of the wolf, a very lonely, mournful sound. The augmented fourth is the most, well, if I start on the middle C and I take it here, it's a very dissonant relationship. It's this is the most unstable, mysterious relationship we have in, in music. Quite ugly and jarring by itself. And, and Bernstein in West Side Story uses it all over the score uh, to show the, the tension between the rival gangs, the jets and the sharks, right? So it's all over. Uh, um, and it hovers throughout the score to show the conflict. But at this point, with I bet you know what I'm going to do, Maria. The song <laughs> starts out with the augmented fourth. It just hangs there. And then Bernstein does something really magical. He resolves it. We have the resolution of the, ten the tension. That one note. you that's beautiful thank you and and Hank you know sorry go ahead I was going to ask Hank that, that that sound resonates for you doesn't it because you've heard that same augmented fourth I think in the call of the wolf well may we hear that sure wonderful you know um to go with the erstwhile music the publication of it the spring creek project at oregon state has created this series of of 20 um, we call them tiny concerts because they're only like four minutes long um, each is about the music of a different animal and in each one a wonderful writer reads an excerpt about an animal that's accompanied by a live musical performance so we have rochelle playing um let's see you you play for Tyrannosaurus Rex, right? 
Yes. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. So you're playing along with friends. Uh, and <laughs> Hank, you you did a beautiful series of, of songs or of mu natural music for the um, from the Dawn Chorus at any rate. Um, and Robin Wall Kimmerer um, read an essay about the common myrrh, which will break your heart, accompanied by two Corvallis musicians. And I had intended to play hers, but the technology isn't working for us very well, and uh, nor is time. So what I will do is ask you, please, if you're interested in this mixing of, of natural sound and, and words and music, to go to Spring Creek's website, which is just the Spring Creek Project, and um, read down in there, and you'll find links to all 20 of these, uh, all 20 of these tiny concerts. Oh, they're, they're, anyway, they, 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 I, I hope you will do that. And um, I regret not, not playing you, Robbins. But, but can we talk a bit about this, dear friends? I mean, can we talk about how we hold both the sorrow of extinction and the pure joy of that wild music. You know, when Hank and I have our best conversations, we're on an Alaska beach and we have a fire and we have a bottle of whiskey and uh, we pull up a rock and we ask the hardest questions. So, so everybody here, can you pull up a rock? And, and um, let me just ask you how, how do you, how do you live at this balance point? How do you find that, how do you find that balance point between the sorrow of the loss and the magnificent joy of, of the music. Um, maybe we have time to just go around once, do you think? Um, do you wanna, um, let's just start, Saul, Saul, start us off. You're in the, you're in the corner. I, boy, staying, staying sane in this world that this, this kind of realization that, that things are leaving is really hard. I think for me, I have to, make sure I stay at least partially in the moment. Uh, kind of what Hank was talking about when, when he's out and everything just happens to be just right. It, that's the time when I'm paying attention to the wind, to the birds, whatever it is. Um, and I'm just, there's no, there's no thought of future or past, which both have elements of sometimes these days tragedy in them. But the moment, especially in nature is is the moment. Mark, are you, are you, I'm sure you think about this all the time. Oh yeah, I'm reminded of it constantly. You, when you were speaking earlier about the loss, you know, we've lost half the coral reefs in the world, half in just the last few decades. And they I only account for 0.01% of the ocean surface, these rainforests of the sea that have the greatest concentrations of species on the planet. I, for me, it, it's, it's holding the dichotomy between hope and despair, knowing that despair is a dead end that leads to nothing positive means that I must be hopeful. And to be hopeful, I must be replenished. And I'm replenished every time I'm underwater. And just, you know, looking at my grandchildren in the eye, I can't just dump despair on their laps. I have to show them the wonders of nature and the beauty of it all and try to instill that hope in them and then just keep going. What's the, uh, there's a terminology for it. It's called um, um, tragic optimism, I think is the terminology I've heard recently. Oh, it is interesting, isn't it? That as we're trying our hardest to save the wild creatures, they're trying their hardest to save us, to keep us from <laughs> losing hope. Rochelle, where are you on this one? Well, I, I'm such a musician. I, um, I actually gravitate often to sort of melancholic, dark music. And I was thinking about that. Why do I do that? And it's because I can immerse myself in this art form and uh, use art to sort of uh, express my sorrow, I guess. But music also has this capacity to energize me and, and move me toward the positive. And I, I think and I hope that our human tendency is to gravitate to the to the positive. And for me, the music takes me to a, a hopeful place. And uh, it kind of equips me, I guess, to 
get out of that reflective place and become more purposeful. And Kathy, our collaborations, they, they always, they move me to joy, actually, even though we're talking about the hardest things, you call them the hard truths. And, um, and I remember, and I think it was river walking, one of my favorite lines, you, you wrote, I take my joy in gulps. Oh, <laughs> yeah, that's right. Great gulps. That's right. <laughs> Great gulps. Yeah, I mean, I love that about you, and and you're dealing with this this topic that I mean, we have to face this this existential crisis. And um, mm -hmm. we're going to ask you the same question: How do you do it? Oh no, I'm going to Hank. I'm sure. <laughs> Hank, Hank, finish up, finish us off, will you? And then, and then, and then I have a favor to ask of you. Um, I cry a lot. Um, and I've realized that if I don't, um, it, it doesn't seem I have a choice to keep my heart constantly open to the world's beauty without um, letting the grief also run through me. That a callus on the heart is a callus on the heart. Um, and uh, it involves an increasing amount of grief to stay open to the beauty. Um, so I make uh, I make room for the um, for grief. Yeah, I, I'd say I didn't mean to dismiss your your question, Rochelle. I, I think honestly that I've I have it's so it is so much fun to learn about natural music and natural creatures. It is so unbelievably astonishingly wonderful that there is just pure joy in that. And then as I did in this book, I can sequester the sadness and put it in a little box. Um, not, not denying it, not writing about it, but, but letting it be separate from, from this, this pure joy, um, which is out there waiting for us everywhere we look. Um, Hank, the favor I'd, I'd like to ask is, would you, um, would you help us would, would you play us maybe some sounds that we can just sit back and we can listen to, we can close our eyes and be immersed in them and uh, let us end the program by just this deep listening? Absolutely. Um, so this is um, just a compilation of wild voices, some iconic ones. You'll recognize the loons. There's some, some murs, there's some brown bears fighting and some sea lions. Um, and some thrushes, of course. Good, of course. Um, so let's let's um let's let's sit back and accept this gift from three and a half billion years of evolution. And then when we are done with that, then we'll come back and we'll see if you have any questions for any of us. All Thank right. You. Here, here we go.
Thank you. Thank you so much. Claire, will you come back now and invite questions? And, and we're all here and we're all happy to do our very best to, um, to address them. Wow. Um, well, actually the first question that was asked is the, the Hank sounds were perfect for that because we have someone, I can't remember what their name is, um, who wants to know if it's possible to listen to your sound library somewhere, Hank? Um, you know, not in its entirety. It's, you know, it's, it's thousands of sounds deep and it's, um, uh, the majority of them are Richard Nelson's. Um, um, he died a year ago and I'm sitting on his library as well. There, a lot of them are with Cornell University. It's a little bit cumbersome to get to them there. Um, I've, posted various sounds through blogs. There's Sounds from Alaska, part of a blog series with Orion. You can go and find songs there, sounds there. Uh, there's some on my website. Um, and But the best place to go is Encounters North, which is Richard Nelson's archive of these wonderful 30 minute radio programs, which are all built around sound. So Encounters North, there's a hundred programs um all about some facet of the natural world so i'd, I'd direct people there right and, the, and also the website for the um glacier bay national park has a lovely collection of the sounds and a, a little quiz so that they'll play you a sound and ask you to figure out what it is and that's a lot of fun too and and if people you know have um an interest in a particular sound um i'm happy to share them this library is all about being listened to so it does it's not doing anybody any good sitting on my hard drive. So if anybody has any ideas on how to get these sounds out in the world, just get in touch. How could how could one get in touch with you? Um, I'll uh, I'll put um, I'll put an email in the chat. Awesome, thank you. Um, and let's see. Um, in the Q and A, we do have a couple of questions here lined up. So Bill wants to um, know. He says, I'm wondering if anyone might comment on the significance of John Cage's piece 433 as encouragement to us as audiences to simply listen attentively to our immediate world, the sonic environment about us. Rochelle, I think that one's for you. <laughs> Four minutes and 33 seconds is, is a famous piece. Uh, basically, the, the pianist comes, or I think it was written for piano. Uh, sits down and sits in with the audience and never plays a note. Uh, he closes the lid. She, um, they close the lid and listen. Everyone listens together to silence. And uh, it's a it's a amazing idea. Actually, he, he did this in this uh, late in the '60s, I think. So uh, it actually changed the definition of music. What is music? M music is, is, a, is a time frame in which we experience from beginning to end this event. And uh, we box it up and experience it from beginning to end. So yes, listening to the world, listening to nature, the sounds of nature, um, that intense listening is right up John Cage's alley for sure. <laughs> it's a fun piece to play. Very easy to learn. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'll bet. <laughs> well, and there's two more questions for you, Rochelle. Um, and they're from, from Rose. Uh, she wants to know if you have any composers who inspire you in your Spring, Spring Creek project. And um, is your music a lot of improvisation? Oh, well, I don't improvise. So that's an easy answer. <laughs> um, it's a gift that I've never developed. I think I could do it. It would be a lot of fun. And, and perhaps in my old age, I'll pursue that. Um, the music that we use in Spring Creek is always a collaboration with Kathy and I. Uh, we think about what the, it's always a challenge, actually a fun process to come up with music that's fitting for the writing. And um, I love Rachmaninoff for that. The music I just played, this one, is a piece of Sibelius. Uh, he loved nature, a Scandinavian composer. So it's just really right for, for nature. So um, those are two of my favorites. I like music that has a lot of imagery in it. Mm -hmm. That's another topic. 
the film the film that Rochelle and I did together is called Extinction Variations. You go to YouTube and just enter Extinction Variations and you can hear it. Um, Rochelle plays variations on the theme of Corelli, which is an extraordinary piece by Rachmaninoff that, that begins with, with really, I, I would say, Rochelle, with, with anger and despair and then moves into bewilderment and then ends with this kind of resolve that I think is, is, a, is it tracks, I think, very beautifully how we must be. We, we can begin with sorrow and we can begin with, with rage at what's happening, but then we have to start asking ourselves, what does this ask of me? You know, how, how, how am I going to respond to this? And then, and then in the end, um, maybe you could play just a couple little pieces of that, Rochelle, where those chords come in so, so resolutely. I am strong. I am in love. I will not allow this to pass away on my watch. At the end? Uh, no, no, um, let's see. It's a 20 minute piece. So I'm trying to figure out <laughs> my mind's going, where is she? <laughs> um, um, right where we say there's we have there's three things we have. yeah there's three things there's three things we have to do sorry i, I it's been a long time but you feel that energy right there this is i just have to say this this is all variations on this gorgeous melancholic theme That's the, the theme, which is trans. It, it, we have 20 variations in a coda. And Kathy's yeah. talking about about two thirds of the way through where it does change gears and it becomes more positive in energy. But yeah. I feel like it's still a green. So that's the extinction variations, and it's on YouTube. And um, that was really the inspiration. And that collaboration was the inspiration for this book, Earth's Wild Music. Right. So. Jennifer Hahn in the audience, uh, another local uh, Bellingham. Author. We're not hearing you. Oh, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, sorry, I was speaking too quietly. Um, we have a question for us all. Um, will you be having more writing retreats at the North Cascades Institute? And if you are, how about inviting Kathy and Hank? <laughs> and what about a listening to nature retreat? And can we have one in Hawaii with Mark? <laughs> <laughs> That's all from Jennifer. That's all from Jennifer. <laughs> we know we know where Jennifer lives. Um, uh, the simple answer is yes. I think that those are great ideas. And um, when we when we started the institute, we were talking about we, we wanted to focus on the Northwest, and then we had a uh, uh, the brilliant idea that every place is Northwest of somewhere. So Hawaii, of course, is, would not be a problem at all. Um, but yes, I, th I mean, I think, you know, now that the Learning Center is opening back up and we're, we're rescheduling programs there and, and, you know, I think things have begun. It is, it's a perfect place for writing retreats. It's also a perfect place for just being together. I mean, doing what we all love to do right now, which is getting people together to have these kinds of conversations and the fact that we can do it via Zoom is, is, is really a happy miracle. And when we do it together in a place, um, you know, like that, that's even more incredible. So yes, I mean, Christian's listening and, and he's got, I'm sure he's gonna take this, he's, I'm sure he's scribbling away right now. Uh, and we'll see a full proposal on my desk tomorrow, but um, <laughs> no, this is, this is what we're here for, is for helping make things like this happen. Yeah, there are a lot of people who can't wait for things to open up at the North Cascades Institute again fully. So, um, yeah. so much, so much wonderful work goes on there. Um, so, there are no more questions right now. This is everyone's last chance. Don't you? This, you, this is now's the time. If you have questions for our for our um, guests this evening, please uh, put them in the chat or put them in the Q and A. I will go ahead and oh. <laughs> Does the North Cascades Institute have a piano for Rochelle too? <laughs> Good idea. All, all things can happen. Yes. <laughs> Good. Just requires well, some imagination. There you go. <laughs> well, being the bookseller in the room, I would like to remind everybody 
that this beautiful book is available at Village Books and the link that I just put in the chat actually takes you straight to the page where uh, books from all of our authors presented this evening are available. So conveniently on one page you could get a copy of Earth's Wild Music, Headwaters, and Raven's Witness. Isn't that, isn't that convenient? Um, <laughs> so, and to those of you who ordered books at registration for this event, thank you so much. I just shipped out a, a stack today, so um, they are en route to you if you have not gotten yours yet. Um, so, um, with that, is, are there any final thoughts from anyone? Well, my thoughts are all gratitude, Claire, and, and, and to these wonderful people who showed up here to tell about the sounds they love the most, my deep gratitude, and to the readers, uh, you know how much I love you, and to Village Books and to the North Cascades Institute, deep, deep thanks. It's been a blast. And this recording, um, if you want to go back and watch it again and listen to those sounds again, um, it will be on the Village Books YouTube channel, so you can you can watch it um, anytime. So there's all kinds of love in the chat. I don't know if you're if panelists if you are seeing that, but everybody's lots of warm warm gratitude and thank you. So I think that that's it. So hi everybody. Thank you for say coming. Good night. Yes, thank you all for coming. Okay. Aloha. <laughs> thank you all. Bye-bye. Yeah, thank, thanks, everybody, for listening. Thanks for being here.